there are just things that people refuse to spend money on. Things that people, it's a no-go. No matter how much pressure comes down from friends, family, or society in general, they are not going to buy these things. In this video, I'm going to share seven of the things that I am not buying. Now, I'm going to caveat this with currently because previously I have done a video like this where I said, I am not buying an air fryer because, you know, that takes up a lot of space and it's not worth it. Well, ended up buying an air fryer or getting one as a gift actually and loving it, using it several times a week. So these are seven things I am currently not using. Some of them hardcore, hard stop, never gonna buy. But let me know down in the comments below, what are things that you refuse to spend money on? I wanna know. Two things before we get to item number one. Please understand that just because I don't spend money on these things doesn't mean it is wrong or that you shouldn't do it or should feel bad if you do buy these things. I am sure there are things that I purchase that you do not. Number two, if you want to help my channel out and you enjoy watching my content, you can help out my channel by clicking that like button. You can share this video with somebody you think might enjoy it. And you can also click on the subscribe button down below. Number one is meal delivery. The cost to have this is very expensive. Eating out is already very expensive. And when I talk about meal delivery, I'm not talking about grocery delivery. I'm talking about where you go through a third party, something like Uber Eats or DoorDash, I'm sure there are others, and you order food from our local restaurant. They pick it up for you and bring it to you. Number one, I prefer not to have soggy food. And when they bring it to you, it's usually a little bit longer than if you even went and picked it up yourself. So it's sitting in that plastic box getting even mushier than it was supposed to be. Also, the amount of money you pay is huge. I wanna to talk to you about this article. This article was found on thefool.com and any article that I reference in this video will be linked down below so you can read it in its entirety. This one was called The Average American Spends This Much Per Week on Food Delivery and it was written in November of 2022. So think, this is over or about a year and a half later by Natasha Etzel. It says that a recent survey by Circuit found that Americans spent $37 weekly on delivery, resulting in a monthly spend of $152 and a yearly spend of $1,843. Many Americans use food delivery apps like Grubhub, Uber Eats, and DoorDash to get food delivered from restaurants and eateries in their area, but these can be expensive. Customers end up paying service, delivery, tip cost on top of the price of their food. On average, Americans spend $12.80 per order on service fees, delivery fees, tip expenses, or $654 annually. That is above the cost of the actual food. So for me, if I can't go out the door and go get it myself, I'm not gonna worry about having it delivered. I'm just gonna cook it home. Number two are impractical shoes. I am at an age and stage in my life and confident in myself to no longer worry about wearing shoes that are uncomfortable but cute. And I remember I watched this one vlogger who I check in with every once in a while because they live in my area and she showed a pair of shoes in her closet. These shoes had a high heel, a small thin strap across the top and they were really fluffy and silvery. And I remember her making the comment, you know, look at these shoes, aren't they so cute? I have no idea where I'm going to wear them but I had to get them because they were so cute. Here's the thing, just because they're cute doesn't mean you need them. If you wanna buy them for yourself, you're gonna wear them, you're gonna enjoy them, you're gonna love them, and you don't mind the pain, more power to you. But for me, I have no reason to wear uncomfortable shoes just to impress someone else. There are plenty of shoes that you can buy that look nice, that are polished looking, and do not cause pain in your feet. Number three are extended warranties. These things are getting out of control. In the past, you obviously might have got offered extended warranties for the vehicle that you have or for your home or for something like you buy a generator or some major computer purchase. But they have gotten so bad that you go and buy something for $20 on Amazon and you automatically get a prompt, do you wanna spend $4.99 to get an extended warranty? when what you haven't even looked at is what exactly that warranty covers. Most people think it covers a lot of things that could go wrong with that item, but they buy it without even reading the fine print. I found an article on the Washington Post called Why Extended Warranties Aren't Necessary. 
It says that most extended warranties have many exclusions and conditions over which you have no control. They may cover a broken wire, but not failure caused by a power surge. And many warranty providers contract with third-party repair companies, so you have no idea who will service your item or how reliable and skilled they are. Electronics and appliances have a rapid depreciation value, so if something can't be repaired, you may have no choice on the replacement model or the warranty provider will use the depreciated value. Keep in mind that retailers get a percentage or a commission for every extended warranty sold, and they often incentivize salespeople to push them. Whenever salespeople say, you must protect the item, that's a red flag. They're looking to make extra profit. And also pointed out here is that if you are financing the purchase and buy an extended warranty, you will pay interest on that too. Everyone is making money off that extended warranty except the consumer. Now you may have had a situation where you had something and you had an extended warranty and it worked out for you. What I'm stating here is in that most cases, it does not. Somebody loses the information on the warranty. They never actually activate the warranty. The warranty excludes what happens more often than not to that item. So the point here is to do your research, see what is covered. If you are interested in doing those warranties and think about the likelihood of the things that are covered actually occurring in the item. Also don't discount the time and the headache of trying to recover that warranty by reaching out. In the article you will also read, they talk about in here that most items come with guarantees anyway of them being operational, of them working, of them having a warranty free that comes with it. All you have to do is register that item. So you may not even want or need that extended warranty. What comes with it might be sufficient. The fourth thing I am not buying are clothes that specifically say dry clean only. Now I'm not talking about the suit that you need to get dry cleaned or the wool coat that you have that you've had for years and you get it cleaned every other season. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the everyday pieces that say dry clean only. I just won't buy them or I will wash them on gentle or even hand wash them. And if you're not familiar with what dry cleaning actually is, it is treating a garment with a chemical solvent. That is how they clean it, dry cleaning. What people don't think about is the extended cost of dry cleaning an item. Dry cleaning in my area can run anywhere from $3 for a shirt to $80 for a nice coat. So let's say you buy something that costs $50 and it costs $3 per cleaning to clean it. If you clean it 20 times over its lifetime, you're going to end up paying $110 for that $50 item. The fifth thing I am not buying is fast fashion. The clothing industry has created 52 seasons in a year, whereas we used to have four. And this is just to create more revenue, more profit in the industry. So much of this fashion is just thrown out because after several washes or wearing for one season, it isn't even in a good enough shape to take to a consignment, to try to resell, or even in some cases to donate. I looked up the definition of fast fashion on Wikipedia just to give you a little bit more insight. Fast fashion on Wikipedia says that it is the business model for replicating recent catwalk trends and high fashion designs, mass producing them at low cost and bringing them to retail quickly while the demand is at its highest. Rather than giving in to the fast fashion industry, I try to buy classic pieces that will last for many years. And I actually see that that is happening because I can look back at my YouTube channel, which I've had for six years now, and see shirts that I've worn in thumbnails and in videos that I still have in my closet today that I've worn throughout the six years that I've been making videos. So I try to spend more upfront so that I spend less in the long run. Number six are car payments. Growing up and until I was in my late 20s, I thought that just having a car payment was just something that hung around your entire life. It's something that was always there. You always had a car payment. By the time you got finished paying off the car in the five, six, seven year loan, it was time for a new one. So again, just a continual rotation, a never ending cycle. But that actually isn't the way. You can pay off your loan early. You can save small amounts while you have a running great vehicle right now, put money aside to reserve in an account for a future car purchase and pay cash. 
When people look at a loan or go to buy a new car, they don't actually look at what they're spending over the life of that loan. They will look at what their payment is and see that their payment works within their budget, not actually at the value that they're getting for the purchase. So I wanted to look into it and show you how much extra you actually will pay. In my area currently, if you buy a new car, the interest rates are running anywhere around 7.5%. Again, it's obviously gonna depend on the car you buy and your credit score. Used cars are running anywhere around 11%. So I found a calculator on investopedia.com and I will link that down below so that you can look at it. And I also found the average cost of a new car. I put in $48,000 with zero down payment and I selected this term of 72 months, which is about average at that new car rate of 7.5%. That payment is $830 on a $48,000 car. Again, the average, knowing that there are many that are above that. But over the lifetime of that six years, you will have paid $11,754 in interest. So ultimately, that $48,000 car cost you almost $60,000. In this example, you are paying 24% more than the sticker price or the out the door price of that car. Would you have even bought that car if you had saw that it said $59,000 instead of $48,000? Most people don't want to sit down and look at that actual number and have that reality hit them in the face because they would probably make a different decision. Now, if you currently have a car loan, again, and I've had car loans plenty in my past, not a problem. The best thing you can do though is start paying more towards that principle of what you owe, paying it off earlier than that six years so you don't pay the interest for that entire loan cycle. So as you pay more principal balance, the, low, the interest rate that is charged each month gets lower because the interest rate is charged on the actual loan balance. So if you pay it off earlier, you pay a little bit extra each month, over time you are going to reduce the overall wasted expense of interest if you can do this on your car loan. Number seven is an item that I have not spent any money on in over a decade. Over a decade ago, I got rid of it and I will never have it again. And that is cable TV or satellite. We got rid of it a long time ago. In place of it, we got a antenna that is flat that sits on the top of our TV. You can't even tell it's there and it goes 50 miles so I can pick up local stations. People have asked me for before what brand it is. We picked it up at Walmart. It was a random brand at Walmart, not the cheapest, not the most expensive, and it works great. In place of cable television and satellite, we use two total streaming services. That's it. The total cost of those is I think 30 to $32 total. And it has all the shows we would need to watch on television. And in general, myself, I don't watch a lot of tele television as it is, but I wanna talk more specifically about this industry and where I think it's headed. The fact is that the cable and satellite industry is phasing out, it is losing steam. And that is because you can spend a third of the amount on one, two, three different streaming services, avoid commercials and watch what you want when you want, rather than waiting until eight o'clock, it's coming out at eight o'clock as everybody's in their seat and then sitting there and going, oh, wait, we gotta wait for the commercial break to go make popcorn. That is no longer the way the world is working. So I believe this is phasing out. I found some interesting statistics that also shows this. I found this article on tvscientific.com and it's called 13 Cable TV Statistics Marketers Should Know in 2023. The first one was an American adult is predicted to watch two hours and 33 minutes of TV daily. The second, 56% of US adults have cable or satellite TV. 49% of baby boomers use cable TV and 59% watch 10 plus hours of TV a week. Only 34% of adults aged 18 to 29 have cable or satellite TV. And the average cable TV package costs anywhere from 114 to $217 a month. And if you look at other statistics over time, you will see a decline year over year in the amount of users using those cable and satellite TV subscriptions. Don't forget to add in the comment section below, tell me what it is that you are not buying. It could be something you'd never buy or something you've decided, now's the time, it's a new year, we're not buying this thing. Put it down in the comments. 
Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a wonderful week ahead. I will see you next Sunday for a new video.